for decades, it's it has seemed that the uh, political system has just kind of stood by why the while these enormous monopolies or near monopolies formed in all sorts of aspects of the economy, including, of course, online. And there's a sign that that may be changing, uh, at least beginning to change. And our next guest uh, has uh, just testified to Congress about uh, about Amazon, but uh, I want to talk to her about that, but also about why it is that we're having hearings about that now and, and perhaps some other aspects of the monopoly problem as well. She's been on the program before. Stacey Mitchell is co-director of the Institute for, for Local Self-Reliance, and she directs its initiatives to, um, to decentralize economic power and to level the playing field for independent businesses. She's a leading thinker in this area. I always appreciate uh, what she writes and what she has to say. So with that said, first of all, Stacey Mitchell, thanks for coming back on the program. It's great to be here. Thank you. Oh, absolutely great to have you. Now, uh, let's start with this. So Congress is holding hearings. You, as I understand it, testified. I've seen your written testimony. Uh, tell us, before we even get into the details of the hearing, just briefly what it was about, but why it was significant that it happened. Yeah, so the, the House Judiciary Committee has undertaken a months-long investigation into the market power of dominant digital platforms. So Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple primarily. And Congress, you know, has been really absent on the issue of concentration, of, of concentrated economic power and monopoly for decades now. Congress used to undertake these kind of investigations into different sectors of the economy regularly. And they would of, often produce these, um, you know, great uh, uh, volumes of information and findings that would then lead to stronger antitrust laws and stepped up enforcement. Um, and for decades, they have not been doing that. This is the first of this kind of investigation in a really long time. And so the hearings were one part of it, but it's a much broader uh, investigation than just the hearings. So, okay, so they're undertaking an investigation. And as you say, it's, uh, it's the first in a long time. And one of the things that fascinates me about this is that uh, you know, there was a time when, uh, I, in my understanding, when it was widely accepted that uh, antitrust was an important part of a government's responsibility, that when businesses got too big, they exerted unfair pressure on suppliers, they crowded other businesses out of the market, they suppressed competition. I mean, we could go on and on, but uh, there was a time when this seemed to be generally accepted that this is something that needed to be done. Congress passed bills, uh, administrations enforced antitrust and so on. And then it almost seems as if antitrust efforts uh, and uh, com pro-competitive efforts on the part of government almost like they went out of fashion or something. I, I guess we could tie it in part to the Reagan revolution or, or whatever, but it seems that the over, it actually kept sinking over decades that somehow maybe even the Bush, W. Bush administration was at least trot, made an effort against uh, um, first Clinton and then Bush against Microsoft and so on, but it seemed like there was just fading interest over the years and that something has turned that around. So first of all, do you think my analysis is right or wrong? And secondly, would you happen to have a theory, if it is at all right, about why that might have changed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're, I think you're absolutely correct that this, you know, this idea of anti-monopoly policy and politics has really been part of American history since the beginning. Um, it's, it was very much part of the revolution against the British, you know, when we dumped all that tea in Boston Harbor, you know, that tea was owned by the East India Company, which was in league uh, and using its power in conjunction with, with the British Parliament to really control the tea trade. And so part of that was a, was a protest 
protest against monopoly power and against the fact that whenever you have concentrated corporate power, it ends up, uh, you know, translating into political power. So Americans way, way back, you know, understood this as really a critical part of, of democracy, of liberty, and also of equality. Um, and at various points in our history, it's ebbed and flowed. We've, we've had to stand up uh, and sort of reinvigorate those impulses at, at different times. You know, the last time was sort of the last uh, kind of great gilded age beginning around the, the turn of the last century. Uh, and in the 1930s, we really resurrected our anti-monopoly policy. And, you know, I think we can correctly see the prosperity and the broad prosperity, uh, generally speaking, of the 40s, 50s, and 60s as owing uh, in significant part to the fact that we had strong antitrust laws, that we kept big businesses in check. Um, you know, of course, women and people of color were still marginalized in a lot of ways in that economy, but uh, setting that aside for a moment, that was a period in which uh, there was more uh, broad opportunity and in part as a result of our antitrust laws. And then, you know, that we had this just uh, dramatic change. Um, essentially, uh, it, 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 it was an ideological revolution that began in the 1970s with a certain school of thinking, uh, often known as the Chicago School, uh, that said, you know, the only thing that really matters, you know, all of these values about democracy, about decentralizing power, about making sure everyone has equal opportunity, none of that really matters. The only thing that matters is that, uh, we have the most efficient economy and big business is efficient and therefore they basically just turned antitrust laws on their heads. So the laws are all still on the books as they always were, but the interpretation of the laws has changed radically such that they're almost used, uh, have been used in a way that is inverse to their purpose. That ideological revolution began in the 70s. It was uh, codified uh, through the antitrust enforcement agencies under Reagan. And then when Bill Clinton came in, he really doubled down on that and took it even further. And really every uh, administration we've had, Democratic and Republican since then, uh, has endorsed that ideology. At this moment, there are some real cracks in the foundation and a lot of people are beginning to question um, that way of thinking. You know, that to me, the fact that there are cracks in the foundation of it is, of course, very encouraging. And uh, I guess we could speculate uh, all day on why that might be. But I would I would think, first of all, that, you know, increasing awareness of extreme inequality in our economy and the role that this might play might have something to do with it. But I also wonder to what extent, uh, and this may get to your testimony a bit, to what extent the fact that people are aware of a few dominant companies controlling the internet. And even though, to be honest, at least speaking for myself, we all use them. I mean, I use Google as my search engine. I do use Amazon sometimes. Uh, we, there is awareness even among their customers that uh, this is probably not healthy. Maybe, uh, maybe that's creating a political opening or am I just speculating too much? No, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think part of what's driving this is that there are these big, like, structural problems in the economy that have been hard to explain. Like, for example, why are wages not growing at all, even though we have really low unemployment? Well, if you start to look at that, as some economists have begun to look at it, um, the answer is that there's not any competition for labor. You know, most people are within a region where whatever their job is, nurse, um, you know, uh, uh, farm equipment repair person, there really aren't many employers competing to have them uh, as, as employees, and that is a help to suppress wages. So concentration, we've begun, we've also had a collapse in entrepreneurship. We don't create new businesses, you know, at, at, we're creating new businesses at a much, much lower rate today than we used to. And again, economists are looking at that and saying, well, this is a market power problem. It's hard to start a business and succeed now because there are these few companies in every sector that are basically strangling uh, entrepreneurship. So part of what's driving this is that we're beginning to connect some of those dots and seeing the consequences. But I think you're absolutely right about the particular role that the power of these tech companies is playing in this. And the reason is, is that the, the, the tech companies, you know, they're not only dominating markets, but they really are becoming the market. Um, they are controlling mar markets at a, at a kind of different 
more fundamental level. Uh, so in the case of Amazon, it isn't just a big retailer. Amazon actually owns the marketplace that most uh, businesses that want to reach consumers online have to use in order to reach consumers. And so they basically own the the, the infrastructure uh, and therefore get to set the rules for who can be on that infrastructure and how they operate. They have a, a structural control over the economy. That's true with Google's control in search and also Facebook's control uh, in the context of social media and sort of the the fact that it is an intermediary for get for people getting news, you know, it, it is it has that kind of power to control what people are are able to see, and I think that that the nature of that control, um, these companies have essentially become a kind of governing force, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they can set rules, they can decide winners and losers, who gets to play, they can uh, affect free speech. You know, there are all kinds of things that they can do with that power that is effectively a kind of governing power. And so I think what a lot of Americans have begun to realize is that these companies aren't just dominating markets, they're actually usurping us as citizens. And that's changed the nature of the conversation. You know, it seems to me that there are, and again, we're talking with uh, Stacey Mitchell of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. It seems to me that there are two aspects of this that uh, maybe both deserve a little bit more attention as we make this evolutionary shift towards understanding the power that some of these companies have. One is what they do, what they've been doing with that power, okay? And we can point to, I, I've certainly, uh, and you know far better than I, but I've certainly heard and talked about some of the stories of, for example, Amazon strangling businesses that don't play by the rules or uh, letting them sell on its platform and then kind of taking the market away from them and in various ways. And, and we could, and perhaps we should talk about that. That's one aspect of it. The other to me that doesn't maybe get quite as much attention is what they now have the power to do, whether they've done it or not. And what I mean by that is, for example, Google. Can you imagine if I wanted to be, I don't know, a chiropractor, I'm not qualified, but I mean, if I wanted to open a chiropractic office in, uh, in, in Baltimore, Maryland, and Google decided for whatever reason that I wouldn't show up on any Google searches of chiropractors in Maryland. I'd be out of business. So they haven't done that to my knowledge. They have manipulated search results in certain ways, but I don't think people think in terms of that's really a level of power that no totalitarian government in history could have dreamed of. And uh, am I being, and when we talk about that second category of power uh, that I just described, the potential, uh, or, or for example, the ability to share extraordinary examples of personal information about you to people who want to manipulate you, which is apparently somewhat happened, but could happen uh, much more uh, drastically. Am I being overly paranoid or is this a legitimate thing that people should worry about? I think it's entirely legitimate. And I, you know, I think the parallels, you know, I, you know, I don't want to be overblown either, but we, we do have to acknowledge that these companies, uh, their model is built on massive surveillance. I mean, that's the key to, 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 all, to all of them in terms of their business model and using that kind of godlike view of what's going on to manipulate markets and to manipulate what's happening in ways that uh, advantage them, that fortify their power, that ensure that there are not, you know, competitors that are able to to come against them. Um, and of course, they're using uh, that position uh, to uh, also be incredibly influential uh, politically. So, uh, you know, I think that those sorts of parallels uh, with, with fascism or totalitarianism, you know, again, I don't want to be overblown, but we have to be mindful uh, of the fact that that is, in a, you know, in, in some ways, the nature of the kind of power that they wield, at least within these these spheres, um, you know, Google uh, does, in fact. Um, 
you know, it, it give more prominent placement to its own sort of search box results uh, as opposed to um, competitors like Yelp that I think you could, uh, and I think academics have, have argued, in fact, produce results that are more closely matched to consumers' uh, uh, needs and, and searches. Uh, but Google, Google will privilege its own, uh, its own sort of product within that space. Um, so that's an example of how it uses that power. Our Amazon, uh, you know, more than half of all shoppers now start their their search on Amazon, which means uh, that Amazon essentially controls whether or not uh, buyers and sellers can meet online. That if you're a company that that makes or sells any consumer good, um, you now have to ride. Uh, uh, on a platform that is controlled by your most ferocious competitor if you want to have a chance in the market. I had a, an executive at a, um, a you know, a pretty sizable uh, performance footwear brand say to me, you know, they can kill a business and no one would ever know and they don't have anyone to answer to. I mean, they have that kind of, of power. And increasingly, the surveillance aspect of their business models, you know, in the case of Amazon, is, you know, extending not just to surveilling their competitors and then using that information to augment their own business, um, but also, of course, surveilling all of us uh, in our homes and through the growth of Alexa and the Internet of, of Things, Internet-connected devices. Um, they're beginning to kind of imagine uh, a lot of information. Their their ring doorbells uh, with ca video cameras on the streets are now attached. Um, you know that's that's video data that's coming into Amazon and is also connected to a lot of lo local law enforcement agencies. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's it, it's at all um, you know out of out of bounds to begin to be co become concerned about the very anti democratic nature of uh, of these businesses. And again, we're talking with Stacey Mitchell, co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And there's another dimension of this concern that maybe we can then talk a little bit about what people are doing and, and what, what Congress might do and so on. But there's another, and if you don't mind, Stacey, just quick anecdote. So, okay, so uh, I started watching, I, I, I got fixated on crime dramas on Netflix from different parts of the world, you know, um, Turkish police procedurals or, 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 uh, or Abu Dhabi courtroom dramas or whatever. And, uh, and, and the, I'm telling the story for a reason. And then all of a sudden I noticed that when I went into Netflix, which, you know, it's great that you can find that stuff if you, if you have the hankering to do it when, when you can't sleep or whatever. But then I found that Netflix was saying now trending on Netflix and there would be some, you know, Iranian crime drama or something. It's like, I'm pretty sure that's not trending on Netflix. I'm pretty sure they're telling me it's trending on Netflix to persuade me to do it. And I guess what I'm getting at is that it seems to me that along with the power of monopoly or near monopoly, uh, there, there seems to be, and it also seems to be part of the culture of internet businesses, that it's okay to lie to people, that it's okay for uh, you know Amazon or whomever to manipulate prices for things based on payment history, or it's okay to tell somebody that something is trending when it's not, if they think that will make them watch it. Uh, is there sort of a, that used to be considered bad business behavior, unless I'm totally out of my mind. And is that something that goes along with, if you agree with my assessment, is that something that goes along with the culture of uh, monopoly and near monopoly? I think that's right. And, and it speaks to the kind of black box nature, the invisibility of what's really going on beneath the hood with these platforms and how much everybody else is in the dark you know, about the kind of information that they're collecting on all of us, how exactly they're using that information, how it affects our experience when we're on their platforms, uh, and, and so on. I don't think, you know, we really have a clear idea of that. And certainly, we do not have a government agency that is paying attention to that, that is overseeing that in any way. So that leaves us incredibly vulnerable. Um, you know, Amazon makes millions of price changes a day. You know, it's we don't know what governs uh, how their algorithm works and what kind of search returns come up. We don't know if, you know, they know that you know people who are 
uh, shopping late on a Friday night are not as price conscious uh, as other times and they're kind of jacking up the price. I mean, they certainly are positioning themselves to be able to offer all of us different prices um, and to the extent that they begin to default into being uh, the primary pipeline uh, for, for goods and services, uh, we less and less have any sort of outside reference uh, for, for what they're doing. You know, in traditional markets, or I should say real markets, you know, and you can think about your farmer's market just as a really basic example, you know, information is pretty much uh, equally available to anybody. You can show up at the farmer's market and see you know, what people are offering for prices and, and who's lining up to get, you know, particular, uh, particularly juicy looking tomatoes. And, you know, the fact that this farmer is selling some kind of odd, uh, you know, version of cauliflower that you've never seen. I mean, all of that information, you know, pretty much anyone can go and collect and, you know, it's, it's pretty equitably available. And of course, a farmer's market is also governed by public rules, you know, who can participate and on what day of the week and where is it located and everything else. Amazon, you know, our online market uh, is, is increasingly governed by Amazon. And they're the only ones who have any access to this information. You know, the rest of us, both the businesses that operate on the platform and consumers are completely in the dark as to how they're using that information or how they're directing our attention, you know, um, and, and why they're delivering certain results in the, in the, in the search. Um, and what that means is that it's, it's essentially not a market, as in it's not an open public place where people can trade on equitable terms, it is a private arena governed by a, a kind of a king um, that sets the rules for everybody else. And that is the reason that it's just fundamentally uh, undemocratic and, and fundamentally threatens our liberties. Well, you know, and some you, you make a great point, Stacey Mitchell, because I think, you know, some people might listen to this and think, well, you know, liberal media, liberal hosts or whatever. But actually, uh, there was a time when conservative ideology really believed in markets and that, you know, from my economics courses, that that meant uh, full exchange of availability of information for a market to function as, for a free market to function as a free market. If you think of yourself, and I don't mean you personally, but if one thinks of oneself as a free market person, including a conservative, th then the information can't be one-sided, or, or as you say, it's not a market. So uh, I'm hoping that maybe this, this uh, increasing awareness of the issue is not just on one side of the aisle, but is something that uh, eventually, if not now, both, part, both sides of the aisle, or at least the ideological aisle, can participate in. I hope that's true. And we certainly seen, see signs of that now. I mean, there are Republicans who are speaking out to some degree on these issues as well. Um, and we know, of course, on the Democratic side that we've got folks who still don't get it, you know, who, who, are, uh, who are supportive of corporate power. So um, it is uh, a mixed issue. And I, I do hope that the and I, 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 we do see signs that there is, uh, you know, sort of a broad Certainly, when you talk about citizens, you talk about people in the country, there's a broad constituency for this. I mean, you can have this conversation anywhere and people get it. People understand that the economy is rigged. They understand that there are a few big players that set the rules and that the rules favor those big players. Um, I mean, everyone on some level basically gets that, uh, sort of regardless of how they identify politically. Um, you know, and I think you're right about markets. Um, markets, I mean, I'm a big believer in markets. I think they deliver incredible benefits. Um, and there's a lot to be said for kind of the creativity um, of markets and of, of entrepreneurialism that I think re I really like. And I really like uh, that that's, you know, I think that's a big part of our strength as a country. It's part of sort of our freedom, if you will. Um, but what we have to understand is that markets are always structured by rules. There are always parameters that are set for how, how markets operate. And the question is, are those rules going to be set by a handful of corporations or are they going to be set by a, a democratic process? Um, and that's really where the, where the fault line is. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And by the way, I don't want to hear anyone else in politics tell me they're pro-business if what they mean is pro-corporate because they're not the same thing. And I think that's part of your point. Um, so what are some, that's a good way to translate to uh, what are some of the uh, policy solutions or democratically driven solutions that you think we might um, we might propose and demand that our elected officials uh, uh, enact. Yeah, that's a great it's a great question. So um, we have laws in place that are quite robust and are probably robust enough to actually deal with these problems. Like we we have laws that you know allow us to break up companies that have become too powerful. So in the case of Amazon we really feel that if you're going to operate the infrastructure, you can't also compete on that infrastructure. And so Amazon as a, as a retailer, as a manufacturer of goods has to be a separate company from Amazon that runs the platform. Uh, and that the platform uh, operator, you know, has to be something like a common carrier, you know, something as, as we've done with other networked industries like railroads, telephones, where we've said, okay, you own the infrastructure, you have a public interest obligation. You have to let all comers, you have to you have non-discriminatory terms basically in how you operate. You know, that's the solution I think to the kind of market power that Amazon has. Um, there are different ways that we can get to that solution. We could get there through uh, the antitrust enforcement agencies at the federal level or through state's attorneys general bringing an antitrust case. Now, because the courts have generally gone along with this ideological revolution that we talked about earlier that began to happen in the 1970s, the courts in general are reluctant to hear that ar argument. Um, I still think that there's some good reasons to bring those cases. The way you change courts is you bring cases and you make new arguments and you begin to convince judges and you bring in new ju judges and so on. So, uh, you know, I think that that's an important pathway, but we may we could also get there uh, perhaps more quickly um, through uh, legislation enacted by Congress that clarifies that in the case of dominant digital platforms, you uh, have to have this separation. You cannot com be both the platform operator and a competitor on that platform. You know, and perhaps in that context, uh, it's not just the the tech tech platforms that we want to deal with, but perhaps what we also want to do um, is for Congress to step in and clarify to the antitrust agencies what Congress's intention really was around these laws. Um, you know, we currently have a Federal Trade Commission, which is in charge of our antitrust laws and the Department of Justice. Both of them have been doing, I would argue, a terrible job for decades, especially on the tech issue, but in lots of other sec sectors of the economy. So how do we get them back on the right track? And I think Congress needs to exercise some oversight, and that may even include uh, passing legislation that strengthens our antitrust laws and, and clarifies their intent. Well, I think all of those sound like sound answers. And I also wonder, uh, in addition to Congress, what would happen if, for example, I guess California would be the, if, if one state, uh, like California being the largest, uh, were to enact different rules regarding some of these corporations, whether that might have national implications as well and force them to change uh, the way they do business on a national level too. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I certainly think that there are some avenues there, and uh, I think people are beginning to look more closely at that. States do have their own um, uh, sort of versions of antitrust laws and, and sort of unfair trade laws, some of which uh, retain kind of their earlier character uh, and, and have not been altered. Um, so it, it's, it's, there's a potential to bring a case based on those laws. There's a potential to also pass laws at the state level. Um, um, and I think those, you know, as this sort of movement around anti-monopoly grows, there are more and more people looking at the potential in those avenues as well. I think what's, you know, important here just to, to note is that, of course, this isn't just about tech. Um, although for all the reasons we've been talking about, big tech is is kind of driving this conversation and making the kind of perils that we're in for, for not addressing these issues of corporate power, like all the more evident. Um, but one of the great uh, benefits of reinvigorating our antitrust laws and, and enforcement and sort of bringing back this spirit of anti-monopoly 
is that we have so many sectors of the economy from, you know, agricultural processing, you know, what we do to uh, farmers and food producers, how much they're being squeezed, even as consumers are paying more for food. Um, we've got Walmart's dominance in the retail sector, which is really hurting a lot of communities uh, who, who really have only one grocer at this point. Walmart's incredibly powerful in our food system. Um, a lot of our healthcare industry, you know, the reason our healthcare is so expensive in large part is because we have these huge hospital monopolies. Um, we have incredibly consolidated markets. Our, our pharmacy uh, benefits are controlled by two companies, one of which is CVS, uh, which steers people to its own you know, pharmacy against the independent drugstores that are cheaper. You know, I mean, one sector after another, we have these problems. And if we began to enforce these laws and to take a more uh, vigorous approach uh, to uh, monopoly power, it would open up a lot of economic opportunity, innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, and also in a lot more regions of the country than a handful of, you know, coastal cities that are prospering, you know, a lot of the heartland, a lot of the second tier cities that have been left behind, you know, it's because their businesses have been absorbed into these uh, larger corporations, uh, and they're no longer there, or their local uh, uh, farmers are being squeezed, or their small businesses are gone, you know, that's, uh, I, I think this is really a kind of a critical pathway um, to regaining our our local economic capacity um, and uh, our prosperity. Well, now I'm sorry we didn't talk about that too because that's so interesting. So uh, we may in, in further depth, but uh, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I guess my final question for you, Stacey Mitchell, would be uh, where can people go to find out more? And uh, is there any role for citizen action in all of this? Absolutely. So you can find out more about our work, and we have a number of reports on Amazon, on Walmart's market power. We just did a report recently, a lot of resources on monopoly in general across different sectors of the economy on our website at ilsr.org, ilsr.org. If you specifically want to learn more about Amazon, ilsr.org slash Amazon will get you right there. Um, and here is very much a role for citizen um, activism. One of the most important things you can do, frankly, right now is to call your member of Congress's office and say you're really concerned about this, that you're glad to hear that there's an investigation going on in the House Judiciary Committee, and you hope your member of Congress is following that and is uh, really committed to this issue. Because I, I don't think yet, while this issue is sort of moving um, you know, in D.C. and in sort of national media, I don't think members of Congress are clear yet that this really matters to their constituents. And so making it clear to your member of Congress that this is important to be paying attention to would be really helpful. So whether they're Democratic, Republican, just let them know you care about this so they'll focus on it. Absolutely. All right. Well, I do know from my work here in D.C. that they listen to those calls, that they take those calls really seriously, that those calls make a difference. So I think that's a great idea. And Stacey Mitchell, co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, thanks for all your great work in this area and thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. It's been great to be with you. Same here.